So um, I want to just conclude um, my, my colleague's um, presentation. He's taken us through three risks which um, on a global perspective have the potential to affect Kenyan growth in 2017. So just to recap these three risks, he's talked about um, slowing global economic growth, He's also talked about the impact of potential higher um, global fuel prices. And he's also talked about the growing influence of geopolitical developments. And the major aspect of um, GDP that is expected to be affected by these developments has been exports. As we move into the second part of our presentation, um, there, are some, there are some risks that we want to highlight in terms of our domestic environment what is going on in our domestic environment that would influence growth um, this year. So just to pick up from where my colleague left, left off, we want to talk about um, election cycles. Um, we all know that this is an election year, and just to try and see um, the effects that elections have on economic growth, we ran some numbers, and we found some interesting results. Um, just to highlight, for the gray bars that we have on this graph, we've highlighted um, election years together with the years immediately after election years. And we ran some numbers and we found out that um, in election years, global growth, um, local growth averages around 2.6%. If we have to compare this with non election years, the local GDP growth uh, averages 4.6%. So if we were to um, quantify the effect of elections. Um, we can say that um, over the last um, few years, since 1980, uh, elections have the potential of reducing um, economic growth by around 2%, which is quite significant. So um, one thing we'd also want to highlight on this graph, if I can show you the last election period, sorry, we can highlight the last election period, um, we noticed that there was still robust growth, and what we'd like to say is that as much as election years have uh, the potential to reduce um, economic growth, um, political temperatures um, are, are really key um, to this year. So um, what we observed um, during this period is that um, the country was riding high. They were riding in confidence. We just uh, come from promulgating a new constitution and confidence was high. So uh, political temperatures weren't that high. So as the election uh, nears, um, the extent of, politi of political temperatures, political heat, uh, would be a significant uh, guide as to how the elections would influence uh, growth this year. So um, one thing that we believe would be important in terms of the out um, outlook this year, um, we hope for uh, peaceful elections, we also hope for um, um, rapid um, acceptance of the results um, and so that we can just move on with growth. Um, another thing that is um, pertinent to the country this year and something that we've already started uh, witnessing has been um, the effects of drought. So just highlighting this graph um, over here, um, we had a look at um, what the farming early warning system and our own Nairobi Meteorological Department had to say about um, drought. So um, in terms of the farming early warning system, um, they highlighted that um, there's, a, there's a significant risk of depressed food production, particularly maize in some of the growing areas. And our own Meteorological Department has highlighted that um, they expect dry conditions at the beginning of the year. And how, how does drought affect um, the economy in general? So we've highlighted three, three things. Um, agricultural productivity, that is uh, one of the main, uh, main impacts of drought. Um, electricity costs, um, because we still have a significant portion of our electricity generated by hydro, and the availability of water in general. So, um, Continuing on that narrative, we wanted to see um, what sort of effect um, can we expect in a, in a year where drought, um, drought has been experienced. So um, just looking at this graph, we can see 2011 was our last year of drought, and we saw the impact. 
We saw the impact in terms of 2011 and 2012. Agricultural growth was depressed. Um, it was below 3% in both years. And it's quite clear that um, despite making some, some huge improvements in the last few years, um, our agriculture is still pretty much uh, dependent on rainfall. So drought will be a very big factor uh, going forward this year. Um, one thing um, that we also want to highlight is that agriculture contributes around 25 to 30% of our GDP. And if our agriculture is still pretty much dependent on rainfall, um, we can expect it to have a significant uh, say in terms of the overall figure of economic growth that we expect this year. So um, this can be this, um, demonstrated by this graph. So you can see over here. Um, we had um, depressed economic growth, um, agricultural growth in 2009. It declined by 2.3%. And we can see that same year we experienced um, low, low GDP growth by our standards of 3.3%. But then the next year also demonstrated the powerful effect agriculture has on overall GDP. Because um, in 2010, we experienced 10% growth in agriculture. And we can see it also had a ripple effect on overall economic growth, which grew at around 8.4%. So um, going forward, um, we expect the ongoing drought to have um, a significant effect on GDP um, and purely by agricultural output. And one, one other thing that we'd also like to highlight in terms of the depressed agricultural output, something that we've also seen um, in years where agricultural output has declined is we've also experienced some uh, increase in local food prices. So at this point, um, we feel like we can in introduce the, the concept of inflation. Um, still being very dependent on agriculture, um, food prices have a significant uh, contribution to overall inflation. Um, food, food prices um, directly contribute to 36% of the overall um, inflation. And uh, another thing that we also highlighted, um, this was highlighted by my colleague, was the potential effect of increased fuel prices. This also um, contributes through two, two other in, in, in the, um, indices in terms of um, overall inflation. So we have household, household inflation, and we also have transport costs. So together, this, um, these three elements of inflation contribute 63% of overall inflation. And this is where we'd like to focus our attention, particularly with this slide. So just continuing our earlier narrative, we can see in years where um, food inflation wasn't, food inflation wasn't um, that pronounced, we can see the effect on overall inflation that it, it, it was low. Um, but then going on to 2011, we can see over here, food inflation increased to around 19%. And what did that do? It pulled overall inflation with it to about 14%. So um, this is the potential that the drought and by extension food prices can have on overall inflation this year. When it comes to fuel prices, um, my colleague highlighted, highlighted that um, we're expecting fuel prices to increase um, this year. The increases will not, um, will not be um, as big um, as um, to, to, to have a very large um, um, say in terms of the household and the, and the transport costs. So in terms of these um, three elements of inflation, we feel the highest, uh, the highest risk comes in the form of the food, food inflation. That being said, we still um, look out for transport costs and household costs. And we highlight that in this um, summary slide in terms of inflation. So if you were to just highlight um, the risks in terms of inflation, um, we can see over here, food inflation poses the highest risk, and then household and transport costs. So um, what, cons what constitutes household costs? This, this is where your um, water and electricity costs come in. This is where kerosene and gas prices come in. So we can see um, some of the effect um, in terms of drought for water and electricity costs, and we can also see some of the effects of the global fuel prices, also in terms of our household costs. In terms of our transport costs, it's a bit more straightforward. 
we can see that if fuel prices um, increase, um, your transport costs will also increase. So you would see matato fares pro probably increase. And for those who drive personal cars, um, they'll have to pay more at the pump. So these are the these are the three main developments we see from an inflation perspective. And overall, um, we believe um, this could um, push up inflation, and we expect inflation to trend towards the CBT's upper target of 7.5% during this year. Um, moving on, one thing that was um, a significant development in the previous year was the introduction of the low capping interest rates. And as, as it stands at the moment, we are starting to see some of the effects of the interest rate capping rule. So just having a look at the red line, the red line highlights the credit growth that we have seen uh, on a year on year basis. Um, in fact, we put it uh, on a quarterly basis. So as at the end of 2015, um, credit growth averaged around 18%. As at the end of last year, credit growth had declined to around 4%. And with consumption being a very large con contributor to GDP growth, we believe this is a very, very significant risk in terms of uh, economic growth in 2017. Because if the banks are not lending, uh, businesses will not receive um, cash uh, to, to invest. Um, perhaps even individuals may not uh, receive as much cash as they would need to, to carry out their own personal needs. So if um, the private sector is not, um, is not getting as much credit as they would, as they would want, we'd expect to see consumption decline. So what happens in the event that we are seeing um, the contribution of the private sector declining. Um, this is where the government um, steps in, and this is something that we've been seeing in the last few in the last few years. With um, private consumption um, declining, we have seen um, an increased role in terms of GDP growth by the government, where the government has been um, spending in terms of um, large infrastructure projects. We've seen the SGR. We've seen, some, um, we've seen some roads, and we've seen a lot of capital expenditure by the government, and this has played a really big role in terms of the recent GDP growth that we've been, um, that we've been witnessing. So going forward in 2017, it will be important that um, the government keeps spending to support the GDP growth, because we have already seen the private sector um, has been starved of cre credit um, a little bit, and they will have to come in and step in um, to support the GDP growth. So with this graph, one thing that we'd like to highlight is that it is important that the government actually meets its expenditure targets. So just to highlight over here, um, we can see clearly that the government has not been missing too much in terms of its, its targets in terms of revenue. So for the last fiscal year, we can see that they missed out um, on their revenue targets by just, up, um, just above 60 billion. But if we were to compare, with the actual um, expenditure compared to what they budgeted for, they missed out by just over 200 billion. So it's important that they actually spend what they plan to spend such that GDP uh, is supported in 2017. Um, just looking at the expenditure targets now as a proportion of GDP, um, we can see over here that the government um, that the government plans to spend approximately 17% of um, GDP in terms of expenditure and just a, a, about 10% in terms of GDP in terms of development expenditure. So um, one thing we'd also want to highlight over here is that it is important that within the target of expenditure, the government needs to spend, um, to um, actually meet its targets as, as pertains to development expenditure. So just highlighting over here, in terms of the targets that we've already, that we've already seen in the previous slide, um, we've seen that they missed their um, 200 billion um, in terms of spending. Um, we can see over here that for the targets that were missed, it was mostly development expenditure that was, um, that was hampered because um, they had a target of 10.4% um, as a percentage of GDP and what they ended up spending in terms of development was 7.4% in terms of GDP. Comparing that to um, recurrent expenditure, uh, we can see that 
development expenditure has been taking a back seat to the current expenditure. So going forward in this year, um, we'd expect that for economic growth to be sustained, we'd need um, the we'd need, we'd need the expenditure, especially in terms of the develop, development expenditure, to be met. Um, another thing that we'd like to highlight um, during this um, um, fiscal year is we've seen um, an increasing proportion of external debt in terms of the government borrowing. So just highlighting over here, from 2010, we've seen that the proportion of external debt has declined from around, has increased from around 19% in 2010, um, and as at uh, mid-2016, this had increased to around 26%. So um, they've, they've been increasingly borrowing, and they've increasingly been borrowing from the external markets. So um, why is it that they've been increasing more from, um, borrowing from the external market? Um, in terms of the interest payments that they would have to pay, they would have to pay um, the government has been paying much, much lower interest costs in terms of um, external debt. So you'd find that the government is borrowing at say 7% um, from, the, from the external market, while the Kenyan shilling has been declining, has been um, depreciating by less than 5%. So just combining that two gives you um, an average interest, uh, interest cost of around 12%. If you were to compare this with the local market, you'd find that the cost of local debt is actually even more. So this is one of the reasons that they've um, been increasing the proportion of external debt. And if you were to look at it in terms of absolute terms, we can see that from the year 2000, the amount of external debt was around 400 billion. Moving all the way to till around 2010, this had increased by just 200 billion to, uh, to 600 billion. But from 2010 all the way to um, 2016, we've seen the stock of um, external debt increase from around 600 billion to current levels of just under 2 trillion. So um, one thing that, um, one question that can be asked of this is where is this external borrowing going? Is it being used in the right way? So what we've seen in recent years is that we've seen the external borrowing has largely been used in terms of capital expenditures. This is the sort of um, this, this is the um, the sort of um, funding that has been used for projects such as the SGR and other development projects. So as the stock of external debt increases, what we need to ask ourselves is: it, is it going towards um, worthwhile investments? So. Um, we feel that recent investments in terms of the external debt has been um, has been utilized well, and this will be crucial going forward um, because the more you hold of um, external debt, the more susceptible you are to weakness in terms of your local currency. Just to support um, the the increasing use of external debt, something that we can see over here is um, if you are to compare the performance of the Kenya shilling. Um, to other African currencies during the last um, 10 to 20 years. We can see that the Kenya shilling has been actually one of the best performers. So if we were to look at this graph, we can see